Friends, let us listen together for God's word as Jesus shares a word of teaching through a parable in the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee standing by himself was praying this way, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves and rogues, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all of my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. So as we have already shared together, friends, today is the first opportunity for us to worship on a Sunday in the season of Lent. So it's a time for us to share a little bit about what this season is or may look like in our lives. Lent is a time where we are invited to be a people of prayer and self-examination. It's a time meant to prepare us for what we are gathering to celebrate in just a few short weeks, the resurrection of our Lord at Easter. Lent lasts for 40 days, much like the flood of Genesis or the pilgrimage Moses took to Mount Sinai. The journey Elijah shared to the top of Mount Horeb, Jonah's call to Nineveh, and as we will share together in worship in just two short weeks, it is the same length of time that Jesus was tested and tempted in the wilderness. Season of Lent provides us with reminders of the power and the possibility that awaits us with the Easter mystery. It's a reminder that the way of the cross, the way of faith, passes through the life and death. How in order to fully appreciate the resurrection and the new life that is ours as we rise alongside our Christ, that our way is also through death. Dying with Christ who was raised for us, daily surrendering old patterns of living and thinking, letting go of these present realities so that we may embrace the newness that God is calling us and creating among us to share. Lent is a reminder that what we are and what we have, our possessions, our empires, our projects, even our families, our careers, our churches, and even our very lives themselves do not last forever. We began the season of Lent just a few short days ago on Wednesday with the sign of ashes and the words spoken to remember that we are from dust and to dust we shall return. Our worship and our prayers, our reflections throughout this season of the life of the church are designed to weaken our grasp, to pry each of our fingers loose one by one from those presumed securities that we surround ourselves with and plunge us faithfully into the unknown waters of our baptism. Waters not of death, but of new and everlasting life. Letting go and falling back, trusting that we will not fall into the fear of nothingness behind us, but fall forward in this season of Lent into the everlasting arms of our God, Jesus the Christ, whose arms will be outstretched in love for us on the cross, living, dying, and rising again, so that we may know that in our living and in our dying and in our rising, we too may have the joy and the newness of life eternal. This, friends, is the season of Lent. That sounds good, right? But what does it look like? I wondered this week if there was some picture-perfect image of Lent or some image for Lent that could set the tone for the journey that continues today. A journey that each week presses us forward, urging us ahead to Jerusalem as palm branches are waved and cloaks laid upon the ground. 
and to the upper room as bread is broken and cup is poured, or to a hill outside the city where a Savior will be crucified, buried in a garden tomb, but where the stone will also be rolled away and heavenly angels will proclaim that wonderful and faithful truth that he is risen, he is risen indeed. Today, friends, I propose that we don't have to go that far to find that image. Because I believe Jesus offers us that image right there in the Gospel of Luke, in the parable we read together just a few moments ago. Remember, as Jesus tells the story of two people, two people who, much like us, came to church to worship, to pray, two people who came to do the same thing, but who perhaps could not have come or approached worship in any more different way than each other. Two people who capture in one simple moment the picture-perfect image of Lent. Now, Jesus told this story, friends, not to his disciples. I don't know if you caught that at the beginning of our reading. Some translations say Jesus talked to religious people. Our reading in our translation goes even further. It's not just religious people. It says Jesus was talking to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, but who regarded others with contempt. So there might be some trouble coming for Jesus, yes? Jesus looks them in the eye and starts saying, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now that sets the stage, yes? As remember, regardless of the translation, Jesus, we know, everybody agrees, is talking not to the bad folks. He's talking to the church folk. He's talking to us. And he's telling a story about two people. One, a Pharisee, right? A good, clean-living, religious person, probably someone they aspired to be like. They wanted to be like this person, doing all the right things. So this is the good guy, yes? He was who they wanted to be. The other one is this tax collector. Boo. This is no good puppet of the Roman government who spent his life cheating people out. Maybe it is good time for this (laughs) as we approach that season in our lives. But we think this guy's got to be the bad guy, right? The tax collector can't be good. And yet, both of them went to the same temple to do the same thing. They came to church to worship, to pray. I remember the Pharisee had this great elaborate prayer that was all about himself and his greatness. God, I thank you that I'm not like anybody else in this church. Those thieves and rogues and adulterers are definitely like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. This guy's got it together. He's obeying the law. He's living an upright life. He's doing all the religious things we're supposed to do. He's fasting. He's praying. He's giving his money to the church. This is clearly the good guy, but not the other one, because he's off in the back of the church, doing pretty much the same thing, sharing a prayer all about himself, but not about his greatness. He prays simply, God, be merciful to me, a sinner unable to even raise his eyes to the heavens. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And not just any old sinner like all of us, right? But a tax collector out there stealing money from people, out there ruining people's livelihood so that he could choose to take his cut and live it up. But in this moment, He comes to worship painfully aware of his own failures that he hangs his head, he beats his breast, and from the back row of the church, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus does, well, what Jesus loves to do. He drops this little one-liner ending into the end of his parable that changes the whole meaning of the message, turns everything on its head, and says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, went home justified. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. And sadly, friends, very sadly, 40 years in the church, This is the point where more often than not, I have heard well-intending preachers stop talking. No such luck. (laughs) 
They allow this proud Pharisee and this humble tax collector to somehow just naturally equate humility with forgiveness. So the great take-home of faith becomes that if we're all a little more humble, or if we're humble enough, or perhaps even if we're humble at all, then we've somehow earned, or that we now magically deserve, God's forgiveness. I don't know if you've heard that preached that way before, but I have. And that would make a great moment, right? It would make a perfect picture image of us. But that's not what we started with, right? We said this was a picture-perfect image of Lent. And here's why. Because at the end of the day, friends, neither one of those two deserved anything. The tax collector and the Pharisee came to worship, and neither one of them deserved anything. The Pharisee didn't deserve anything because he was conceited and self-righteous. He thought he was better than everybody else in that moment. But friends, the tax collector didn't deserve anything either because he was a bad guy. He did bad things. He made poor choices along the way. Neither deserved anything. And the breaking news of not only this season, but every season of the life of the church is that neither do we. What makes this moment, what makes this parable, what makes this message, this teaching, friends, this picture-perfect image for Lent is not to what degree any one of us deserves forgiveness, but how freely and unconditionally God chooses to forgive despite who we are. That time and time again, God chooses grace. Not because we've been humble enough, not because we've been perfect enough, but because God, out of God's own pure, unadulterated, untethered, unconditional love, has taken the sin of the world on his shoulders. Sin that belongs to you and me, friends. And by the power of the cross and the empty grave, those images that loom heavily over our Lenten journeys, God forgives everyone, including us. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, not because we've done enough, not because we're humble enough, not because we know we're sinners, but because we acknowledge the frailty and uncertainty of life. And instead of relying on ourselves, we choose to sit in the presence of God to grow in the likeness of our Christ, the love, the grace, the mercy that alone may free us all. So I ask us today, friends, how will we observe Lent this year? Will this be a time for us to act extra religious, to make sure we don't miss a Sunday of worship, to make sure we're at all those holy work services, make sure we give up something that just makes us miserable, right? No more chocolate, no more wine, no more junk food, no more television. But how long before we start sounding like the Pharisee, right? Let us not forget, friends, how Scripture invites us each year into the season of Lent. Those words from the prophet Joel that Mark read at the beginning of this time that guide our steps as we journey alongside our Christ to the cross, return to me with all your heart. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Change what is on the inside, not just what is on the outside. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And these are different words, but the same message. We shared these on Ash Wednesday, Psalm 51. This great prayer that in the midst of our insanity, we can cry out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. For the sacrifice pleasing and acceptable to God is a broken and contrite heart. Friends, some of us came here today very thankful that we are not nearly as bad as our neighbor. And some of us came here today knowing fully well just how bad we've been. Most of us fall somewhere in between. But all of us, each and every one of us, regardless of how we came together, will leave here forgiven, loved, and free. 
solely by the love of God, grace of Jesus Christ, and power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. And for all of us, friends, this is the picture-perfect image of Lent. Not a time to act religious on the outside while slowly dying on the inside. Not being good, church-going children of God on Sunday, but living nothing differently from unbelievers every other day. Not waiting for tomorrow to be better, but improving our hearts and our lives today. A picture-perfect Lent. A season, 40 days, that may define our faith and our lives. Time for freedom and deliverance from the past. No longer living overshadowed by the shame and guilt of yesterday's sin, but embracing our freely given forgiveness in Jesus Christ and beginning life anew. Working hard to be people who obey God and worship God and love God from the very depth of our hearts. A picture perfect Lent is an attitude and a mindset, a choice, to live honestly and humbly, confessing our sins and knowing the joyful freedom of forgiveness and then going out from these moments, living these truths and sharing them with others. For this image and its chance to guide our lives, friends, thanks be to God, amen.